So as Kieran is uh, in quarantine, he's asked me to moderate um, this morning. So um, I've been upgraded. I'm very delighted to have done, although they have given me technology, which is not so clever. So um, what I would say is your questions will pop up on here. So if you can get your questions in, then I'll try and manage those. Um, if Kieran were moderating, he would go through everyone's CVs. I'm not going to. Um, Gavin Coles, everyone knows. Um, David, welcome. You've got all of the CVs uh, on the programs. We've got Wei, who's also joining us virtually. Hey, Wei. It's a shame we can't have you here, but uh, all this globe trotting that you're doing. Um, so we are going to have a bit of a conversation here, um, but very much a conversation with you all as well. Now, I just really enjoyed listening to Nicole. Um, I thought she had some really fascinating elements in there. Um, I don't want to steal the conversation, but I just wanted to reflect on a few things that I took notes on, bear with me, which were intelligence-led, I thought was really fascinating. And I know I've got some colleagues in the room that would be nodding away. Nathan, you're speaking later. Um, the regulator and practitioner balance of resources, as an ex-regulator, I was very interested in that. Um, but also um, looking at kind of purpose and professionalizing the industry. Those were just some really key topics. But um, I'd just like to hand over to you, Gavin. I saw you scribbling notes furiously. Just give me a few thoughts for what you reflected on on Nicole's session. Indeed. Um, so th there are a few things that I picked up that I think were really good messages to take back to your your board, your executive, and your colleagues back in the office. And the first one is something we've heard before, but Nicole mentioned it three times. And whenever a regulator says something three times, you need to start paying attention. And this is around the, the culture and the governance and the board and the executive. And the really clear message about tone from the top. And yes, that is linked to some of the historical actions we've seen in Australia. But also, I think it gives you a really good insight into where the regulator may be looking during their reviews and, and inspections of your business going forward. Now, I, I've known organizations in Australia where when money laundering comes on to an executive committee, some of the committee members leave the room to take phone calls and, and do other issues. I think that behavior has to be really stamped on. And I think as financial crime experts and professionals, you need to be broadcasting back to your senior leadership. They have to demonstrate that they understand what Australia, what the government, what the industry is expecting them to do. Now, I'd even go so far as to say, if you're not currently getting in front of your board and executive once or twice a year to brief them on what's changing and where the threats are for your business, I wouldn't see that as a success story for you in your role. Certainly, I've done briefings to a number of boards, and it's very, very nice when the regulator comes in the door, they can have a conversation about, three months ago, we talked about the risk from this particular issue that affects our business, and this is how the executive is proving to us that we're, we're in a good position. So I think it's a really strong message from, from Nicole there. The second, if I may, um, mention of the sanction situation we have and the increasing complexity and the great work that's been done between industry and government uh, since the war started in Ukraine. And there have been some very, very good actions, conversations, dialogues to make sure that we're all acting in concert, which is very important. And I think that what we've seen this year, and Nicole hinted at this, we've seen a lot of Australian organisations that weren't really affected by sanctions historically, they weren't trading with high-risk jurisdictions. They weren't in the industries that were caught up in some of the particular um, risk points. Many, many more Australian businesses have been caught up in this latest sanctions issue. And in the future, the way sanctions are going, with sanctions risk rising for some of our um, Asia-Pacific uh, counterparties, I suggest that almost every organization in Australia has to be aware of sanctions, has to have a plan, because obviously we have Austrac and DFAT ASO working very closely together now. So I think it's, that's the second. And the third, I'm gonna save this one on debanking, de-risking. I think yeah. I'll come back to that later. Yes, let's. Um, can I go to Wei? Wei, your reflections listening to Nicole? 
Well, <clears throat> it's very kind of Gavin to lead the debanking because, you know, the other term of it is actually the de-risking, yeah. which isn't um, new, right? You saw it starting in the U.S., I think, like five years ago, and it's been sort of a, um, you know, a, a knock-on effect in other jurisdictions. And I, I think it has huge implications um, because when you de-risk, you know, is your, your customer's going to get their financial services somehow, right? Either you keep them um, in the system so you can monitor it or they go underground. And either way, it has huge implications saying, well, the, the safety and soundness of the, the financial system, which is, you know, just the banks, right? You have other providers. Um, so I thought that was quite important that she talked about that. Um, the other one I thought really stood out, she mentioned um, about the, the crown penalty. Um, as some of you, I mean, I'm sure all of you uh, know the fact that, you know, crown was penalized because of uh, the abuse of union pay card is the way that money has been moved offshore from China. But what's surprising about this particular case is actually it's nothing new. The use of union pay to move money offshore was something that was, um, you know, discussed and, and talked about like three or four years ago, right? Uh, this was in the case of, of the, you know, the casinos in the Macau, you know, the Chinese governments were trying to figure out how money was moving on to um, you know, Macau um, by, by, you know, their officials and really union pay uh, created that opportunity. But at that point, it was really used by the pawnbrokers. So I think this just sort of brings to mind that, you know, credit cards typically is not, is not thought to be, um, you know, a money laundering tool, but is in fact quite effective because all you see is a merchant transaction, but in fact, it's actually cash moving versus. Yeah. Um, so I thought those two elements of it was, was really interesting that she brought, but, you know, emphasizing what Gavin talks about, which is tone from the top, as yeah. she said, she brought it up three times, so uh, governance and oversight. Yeah, so. yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Wei. And David? Um, thanks very much. Um, it's great to be here. Look, there are so many things. I, I, I've, it's really a whole package of things from, from our side on, a, on an international perspective. So just to sort of put it in context from the APG where the regional, um, where the regional sort of FATF establishment in the Asia Pacific. Um, a number of things, a big emphasis from her was talking about that international piece. So Austrac and other Australian agencies collaboration and cooperation with international partners. But it's really also a really important point for so many of you as, as financial crime experts and in compliance and other functions in the private sector about some of, many of you are from, are from um, organizations that have an international presence of, of either Australian groups with international subsidiaries and, and so on, or from, from international players with, with, the big, with the business here. But this important factor that that, that cross-border collaboration is a really important part and learning from the experience in foreign markets and looking at, at regulatory and supervisory developments, but especially understanding risk and responding and, and deepening risk, risk mitigation and, and learning from, from that experience. Nicole also sort of finished with, with so, there was so much in her speech and then in her remarks in response to questions, but I was happy actually that she mentioned plugging the area of our work, which is that FATF is coming, you know, winter is coming again, um, and not just for Australia, but, but across the globe. Um, and I'll talk about that a, a, a bit more, but, but that it's really, she mentioned sort of 2024, 25 of when, of when Australia's work on getting ready for its next its next compliance assessment. So the, the FATF is, is, is really the, the Austrac of, of the international community. So they're, they're coming to go through, to start a new round and Australia is pretty much always at the start of the international round of assessments. And even though uh, the FATF isn't assessing in any, any business, um, but, but looking at, at the national systems, but it does actually, it will translate into a lot of work for national authorities and then, and then for many of you in the market as, as the sort of pressure builds and it hopefully, I'm sure it will actually increase the pace of reform and really fundamentally on, on effectiveness. And so the last point I wanted to mention about, about what I took from, from Nicole's remarks is that everything she seems to talk about is about effectiveness. And so really moving from, from rules to actually your work and our work making a fundamental difference to, to protecting society from financial crime threats. And w whether it be on, on Austrac's role as a very large supervisor or Austrac's role as a financial intelligence unit and, and, and national security agency and many other functions that it, that it has. Um, it's really, as she mentioned, what sort of gets her out of bed in the morning. So it's interesting to hear that it's really at that, at that piece of your work really making a difference 
to protecting the economy and society, and not just in Australia, because the crime types that she talked about are really about you know, some of the really most horrible aspects across, across our region and across the globe. And so it's a really important part to take into your work about that, about that thought, about, about the, the role that you have on that front line of protecting your business um, and, and, your, and the clients that you have. But, but really fundamentally, it's, it's, you know, it's important work that you do. Uh, you can lie straight in bed at night and, and, uh, about this work. And there's a lot more coming through the pipeline that we're here to kind of work through over these couple of days. So I'm going to just go completely off script because I don't like a script. Um, uh, David, Nicole also mentioned about the Austrac as frustrated around the legislation as we are a couple of times. Mm -hmm. So from a FATF perspective, per perspective, given that you look at legislation and the effectiveness of legislation, mm -hmm. where, what, what does Australia and the APAC region need to do to get it right? All right, so let's just have me for two days. I can talk about this um, nonstop underwater for a couple of days. Um, thanks. Look, not, not, it's not really just Australia, but, but a, so APG yeah, with FATF assesses all of our 41 members. And then we're also closely involved at the FATF with looking across the, the global community on these assessments. And so FATF met, just finished up on Friday. Um, and, and there's a new FATF president. Singapore took over the presidency. The, the ministers of FATF, of FATF countries met in, in April, chaired by Janet Yellen, the Treasury Secretary, and sort of doubled down on, on priorities for assessing and really pushing FATF members first to firstly come into compliance with its standards and embrace new areas of FATF standards and then support the sort of global effort so there's more of a level playing field. And FATF, I think, finally is bringing pressure on its own members to come into compliance with some of these longstanding um, areas so that effectiveness it, it can be much more of a realistic proposition. So we look at uh, the regional manifestation of that and what we see, for example, in, in the regulation and supervision of, of those DNFPPs, that actually it's the, it's the FATF APG members who are probably further behind. And so some of the most important economies in our region have got further to go. So FATF will be really emphasising many of those areas. And and the, the other themes that she talked about, and you just mentioned both of you, for example, in the, in the area of sanctions, and th that, that area, the, the lack of regulation and supervision of some of these key risk sectors that are particularly exposed to sanctions evasion, without those pieces being in place, you know, it's more than just one arm, one arm tied behind your back. It really is a challenge for supervisors and regulators and, and law enforcement agencies and others concerned with this. So the, 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 there's a, both a, a push for for compliance in these areas. And I, I really hope that it gives not just the government here, but in, in so many countries across the region, it, it will necessarily give them much more, um, much more ammunition, much more momentum to, to carry these reforms forward. In some countries, there's been, there, there have been significant delays, um, but then to move much more quickly to be effective in those areas, because there are real strengths on effectiveness in so many other parts of the system. And so unlike other countries where when they stood up the sort of supervisory regulatory piece on DNFPPs, it took them quite some time to sort of come up to speed. But the things that Nicole spoke about, about, about being smarter, using the sort of digital transformation on, on the regulatory and supervisory side as well, that, that we, can be, we can be more efficient and smarter and more risk-based this time with bringing these sectors in. I'm not saying for those countries that haven't covered those sectors, therefore it's been fine to have waited. It hasn't been fine. Um, and we're seeing that play out in, in, in the cases in the market. Um, but there, there's a lot, there are a lot of lessons to take from, from other countries. Again, this, is, this, this presentation, it's, it can be so much richer because we can reflect on, the, the, on what Nicole just spoke about, but the international cooperation piece in our region as well, um, that there are really good lessons to have been learned, not, not just from those more traditional partners, um, that, that might be you know, the northern, you know, the global north, if you like, and so the and other FATF members, but plenty of other countries in our region who have, who have um, regulated and supervised designated non-financial businesses and professions, or who have come a bit later to the, to the um, sanctions uh, piece, but actually have quite a good joined up um, model for that um, in relation to rolling out targeted financial sanctions and their supervision um, and, and strong cooperation. And then on that final one, of course, it's, it's the lessons to, to look at in the Asia Pacific region about which countries really do the interagency coordination and cooperation well. 
um, and, and how, what else Australia can learn from that. And then especially what it can learn from the strong cooperation and collaboration with the private sector, what else then needs to be done in relation to interagency cooperation and collaboration. And we see that as absolutely fundamental. So, so this, this pressure from FATF, we really hope can help countries in the region, including Australia, on the political commitment and, and support, which of course is also about a resources um, piece, which has been such a theme this morning already. Um, but, but then also um, that fat of pressure can also help to look critically about what has and hasn't worked in relation to collaboration and cooperation and coordination in policy setting, at a policy in, and then at an implementation level. And then frankly, it also really helps, I think, to, we all assume that we're, that we're, we're doing a pretty good job. You, you know, I think I'm doing a pretty good job. I hope you all do. I'm sure you are. But, um, but to be really self-critical is a big part of it. So, but, but FATF takes the self out of that and really just comes and will beat you into self, in, into self reflection anyway, because, because <laughs> those assessments, first of all, they're horrible to read. And I want to apologize as an author of, of almost 20, more than 20 of these Mitchell evaluation reports, they're horrible to read. They're, they're a great way to fall asleep at night, but they, they usually have a red hot go of being, of being critical about what does and does not work and what is and is not in place. So it's a real luxury in the fat of world that you, you you know, you don't pull your punches when you, you write those reports. The trick is to dress it up in this language that's almost unreadable, but it should all be laid out for the policymakers and others who know the code to read. Um, and so that will be the case again. So Australia won't get any, any, um, any free rides. Sorry, this is a huge, huge answer. Last one. Um, the, one, of the, one of the last points that Nicole made was also about the opportunities with some, ref, some reforms that FATF are pushing and, the, and that are the priorities set by the FATF ministers and the new FATF president. And one of those areas, for example, is on beneficial ownership. Yeah. Um, so the, the change in the fat of standards last year was essentially requiring a form of beneficial, beneficial ownership registries for legal persons, for companies and others. And that has a real opportunity. There are significant costs to that, but it does shift some of the costs away just from financial institutions. So it should be a good news story for many of you here. If you're a company secretary, it's horrible news, actually. Um, so still your clients will end up paying and possibly paying more. But again, the point that Nicole made, which is about doing more with this rich information. If, if this new, when this new requirement comes through, it, it, will be, it won't be as effective if it's not picked up by, by all the economies in the region that they're your, your main partners. And that if, the, if all the authorities don't really do the most with that can be done in all those crime types that she mentioned, and also to make everybody's life a bit more efficient and hopefully not as expensive and with, with more effectiveness coming through that process. So, so there's a big emphasis on some of these reforms actually, actually really going to the heart of effectiveness and not just setting up more rules to be complied with. Right. Mm -hmm. I want to go to Wei because Wei does a lot of work uh, across Asia Pacific. Wei, do you have any reflections on what David just said? said? And then we're going to kind of dial it down into getting get to the meat of the issues. I mean, sure. I mean, just specifically relating to the DNFDPs, I think the biggest challenge um, is, you know, everyone talks about resources on the industry side, but the regulators, you know, the supervisory responsibilities are no different. And I think the fundamental tone needs to be truly seeing the implementation of this is not a zero failure regime, not only from the perspective of the regulator talking to the regular entities, but also from the regulators look at themselves too, right? Because you can, I mean, the, the adoption, a true adoption risk-based approach isn't just about the regulators looking at their regular entities, but also the regulators look at themselves and say, what does the risk-based approach really mean for me to identify the risk in my supervisory ecosystem, right? And looking at what that systemic risk is. Um, and to the point, digitization, and I mean, the pandemic's really, you know, accelerated this, but it really is about doing it smarter um, and gathering the necessary information. This question about beneficial ownership, I think it does beg the question, but everybody knows it needs to be done, but the UK did it very early on, right? It was the first G20 country to do it. But if you, we were just at the European conference and it, the question is, who really relies on it, right? You can submit the information, but who's keeping it updated? Mm. Who's validating that data? <clears throat> Right. And, and so I think that is the question. I mean, the U.S. is starting with the Corporate Trans Transparency International Act. I mean, Corporate Transparency Act of 2020 in FinCEN is going to implement that in a couple, you know, another 18 months, I think, based on guidance. But the question is, 
once you collect the information, who's keeping it updated? Yeah. And who's paying for that? Yeah. And I think that's the lesson that every other economy is sort of waiting on to see before they start the same path. Yeah. Right? No. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, really insightful. And I know Gavin's itching to come in here on, Hi, on a couple of points on both probably resourcing and then tranche two and what that might mean, because uh, I'm we'll, passionate about them. Well, well first, um, Hui's point about the, the beneficial ownership register. If we have one, and I, I hope and think we will have one in, in, in due course, it's critical that legislation and regulation permits everyone in this room to rely upon it without having to second guess, yeah. second check, yeah. just as we can take a passport or a driving license or other official identification and not have to second guess that in most circumstances. Yeah. Because what we have seen in the UK and in other jurisdictions is where there is a, a, an official register or data source, everyone knows it's not really reliable and therefore they go and do a second lot of work and a third lot of work and that's death for us, we're all resource stretched. Leading on to resources, bit of an obvious segue there. Um, I know that, that there's probably nobody in this room that would say they've got enough resources to do their job. Put your hand up if you have. Nobody, okay, fantastic. One, one, over there. one person, <laughs> I think that's the IT guy at the back. Right? <laughs> <clears throat> so this issue of resources is critical because we know what's coming. There is more complexity coming. There is more risk coming. Certainly, the next couple of years, I think, are going to be chaotic, both on a national and an international level. The way the economic cycle is going, we're going to have a lot more activity and change that, that we haven't seen for a number of years. We know that with tranche two, touchwood coming, there will be a large expansion of demand for AML professionals. And I think we're heading into a storm on resourcing for reporting entities and the regulator. I think that if you're having trouble recruiting people today and you're fighting with your finance department for enough money to, to match the market, you ain't seen nothing yet. I think a few years from now, you're going to be really wishing you were back in 2022, believe it or not. And, and, and I say that not to be doom and gloomer. I say that because one of our roles as financial crime professionals is to look forward, is to see what's coming and protect our organization, protect our units from what we think might happen, whether it be a crime threat or in this case, a, a systematic market threat. And the answer to that isn't always more resources. It's just stopping doing stuff that doesn't make sense. Stopping doing stuff that isn't efficient. And this does also link back, unfortunately, to this de-risking conversation, Hui, which is I could see a situation in a year or two's time where financial crime professionals in this industry in Australia are saying to their executive and their businesses, we just have to get out of this market because we cannot afford to recruit the people we need to cover the financial crime risk. And that perfect storm, I think, Sharon, is going to be very interesting how that conversation leads into what the regulation the government is pushing for, which is no, not to de-risk in this way. Yeah, and I think those conversations, I, I saw a lot of heads nodding. I think a lot of those conversations are starting to happen now. Uh, and I think there's going to be that tension between having the right capabilities, and it is about capabilities, not sheer numbers of people, uh, in order to service a market that's becoming even more complex, right? Yep. So, um, and, and, you know, Nicole, not just to take everything back to Nicole, it is about educating people. And, you know, a lot of us have been in this gig a number of years, but the world moves on. And so how do we educate the people that we have within our teams to the future threats mm. rather than the threats that are in the rearview mirror, right? And I, I think that's, you know, something that we all have to face into. And I'm looking at, at Tony, who, who leads my learning team, and it's like, you know, I hope you're taking notes, Tony. <laughs> Very true. Um, and, and on this point of, of, <laughs> of how do you prepare your teams and, and, and your business colleagues for what's coming, Yeah. you have to have the time to think. And there are too many financial crime professionals and, and teams who are really reactive. Every day you're getting bombarded with emails, with demands, with approval requests, with KYC reviews, ECDD approvals. Maybe there might be an investigation kicking off. Maybe there's a sanctions alert you have to deal with and, and a pine on. I think that more than ever, you need to have a conversation with your executive and your, and your finance folks to say, if you're running hot all the time, this is a phrase I use with, with, with my clients, if your teams are running hot all the time, then 
it bro you break down. The engine overheats and you break down sooner or later. You have to have time to think about what's coming. You have to understand the FATF changes in, in, in both global and regional perspectives. You have to understand the market changes that are coming. You have to understand the Austrac change of focus. And if you're not having that time to think and research and look outside of your, your email inbox, it's going to be really tough the next few years. So just on that note, then, you know, we talk about the AML, uh, AML CTF programs and we all know in Australia, you know, each in institution reporting entity, your AML CTF program is basically legislation. So if you breach your own program, you breach legislation. So question to all of you, whoever wants to go first, when is an AML CTF program enough? When is it good enough? Um, I'll go first very, very quickly. Um, the, 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 the unfortunate answer is it's never good enough. It, it, it always has to be changing, always has to be evolving. I, I think we've shifted from a fairly stable period into a period where the change coming from outside means that having a, a, a customer risk assessment uh, methodology that is only looked at every every 18 months or two years isn't good enough anymore. Yeah. So that idea of, of recognizing the change, keeping on top of it and keeping abreast of what's coming is I think that the, the key challenge. There might be elements of your program that you're very happy with that you can put to one side for longer. And, and I think the independent review that you get has to be a critical part of that understanding of what is good in the box and what you need to keep changing actively. Yeah. From, David? from APG's oh. side, uh, you know, we, we, assess the we assess the country and the national authorities work rather than individual businesses, but we do interview financial institutions about compliance and we spend a lot of, a lot of our work actually is with, is with market players. But what we're looking for when we're, we're assessing national systems and the, the work of the supervisor is about whether there is this dynamic relationship that, that it can't be exactly as you say, it, it's sort of never good enough, but it, it has to be alive and there have to be um, vibrant points of exchange with the supervisor and the regulator and then others who would bring in the, the appropriate information in, in relation to risk. And so that the risk mitigation settings and is, is dynamic and overcoming challenges like resources and systems and, um, and, and as, as the markets and as the threat environment changes, that what we're lo really looking for and we're, we're, we're assessing on that effectiveness side is actually how well those things are supported in, in national systems to, for supervisors and regulated entities to, to, really, to really have, have that together in a way that, that's more than just, that, than just a kind of re a retooling of the old rules-based approach where, you know, we have a compliance officer and she or he has a, you know, has a, a, a channel of communication to the supervisor and they have some and they go to the appropriate outreach and so on and so forth. But, but it, it's not much more than that. So it's just, it's sort of a bit of a dressed up. Um, it's a donkey dressed up as a risk-based horse and it, and it really hasn't quite <laughs> gone there yet. That metaphor is new this morning, sorry. Not a unicorn. Um, I've been on Zoom for years, right? This is my first time getting at this conference where I'm not wearing tracksuit pants. So I'm pretty excited. Um, <laughs> And uh, I was going to wear tracksuit pants, but I didn't. Um, but but yeah, so it really it really is that uh, absolutely that that piece about, uh, and I absolutely agree, Gavin, that 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 this feels a fairly staid point because I think it is going to get going to get much more complex. I do hope that in systems like the Australian system and others in the region, actually, that 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 these reforms will hopefully in some ways make your jobs a, a, a bit easier. So, for example, that just to, to have one just to have one regulator and supervisor in relation to sanctions and and. So uh, there are reforms like that, which I think can really help to streamline things. Going right back, I've been in, in, this, in this area for too long, but I, the call we've always had, even at the very highest levels of business, and I remember being at an, an APEC Business Advisory Council about 15 years ago, and the big call from at the very highest level of Asia-Pacific business was that they didn't really mind how much, how much regulatory move there was, as long as it was even between markets, and as long as the impediments to your work were sort of the same and could be overcome in the same types of way. And I think, I think that's probably the best hope for, for some efficiencies as well, is that the bigger picture of what the requirements are, that there's not a huge amount of variation, that there's, there's more consistency at national levels, and then it can really help your, your um, truly dynamic and risk-based compliance work, and including selling it back to, to those who pay the bills in your enterprise. And this is really the fundamental part. Um, I, I always want to make the point at these, at these workshops about, about how, and it goes to this sort of discussion we've been having about, about resources, about the importance and the, the of, of building compliance as a, as a kind of career 
area and of, yeah. and of real strength of, of in people's CVs, but also the opportunities that there are to move in and out of these areas so that you have a mix of experts in compliance functions in, in, in enterprises, but actually also in the supervisor and the regulator that people are moving back and forth between, between business areas because that's how you get that cross-pollination of expertise and experience. Some people you want to have as lifers in these areas. And I know occasionally I go to these sorts of events, for example, and you talk to trade finance folk, um, often some of my favorites, they're hard to talk to because they're often talking in interesting codes. <laughs> but in that sort of area, you get people who really specialize very deeply and without them, you just couldn't, you couldn't run that shop really well and you couldn't build it, build it out. And same with compliance. But then you also need fresh blood at different levels coming in and out of those sorts of areas. And, and I think the true is for supervisors. Sorry, as an aside, one of the unofficial assessment um, uh, indicators that we use is to try to see where, where countries are up to with their supervisors being poached for good staff. So if we go to meetings with banks and we don't find that some of their better people actually have been poached out of government, then I worry that the supervisor's teeth aren't sharp enough, um, <laughs> that, that board's not willing to put up money to steal some of those good, good people. So I see it as a real strength, actually, that if Australia can't keep its staff, um, this is a good sign that they're doing a pretty good job and that, and that you're all reacting to that good job by getting the, some of the right people and helping them to build you up. And then hopefully they'll go back uh, later on. And so you get that, you get that sort of cycle of, of pollination um, of expertise. So it's, it's a complex picture, but I think that we are moving into a, as you say, a really, a really complex time, but also there are real opportunities to, to, to improve things quite, quite fundamentally. Can I pick up one thing that you said though, um, which is around the um, the leveling across the region in terms of AML and sanctions requirements. Mm -hmm. So, so this is something I think that the, that it's it's worth thinking about for your business. We've had certainly since the start of my career a fairly unipolar world with one real superpower and and a fairly agreeable standard for a whole range of of, of regulatory, economic, and other issues, including anti-money laundering standards that, that, that have grown over, over the years. Realistically, we're now looking at a multipolar world and we're seeing separation, especially after the, 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 the events in the Ukraine, separation into differing camps that have differing views on what is right and what is wrong. And certainly talking to some of my clients, I've had conversations already about what that might mean in the future. If, for example, certain jurisdictions say, we are not going to recognize this particular requirement as a good requirement for um, stopping money laundering. We are not going to recognize this requirement or this sanction regime because it's against our national interest. And we're already seeing some, some of that certainly playing out. Now, why is that important to us here in Australia? Well, because we will be in one of those camps. And we have to obviously understand the, the, the collegiate approach that we will be taking. But more importantly, your customers may have exposure to particular parts of the world where different standards may start to apply, or a standard is there in, in, in principle, but isn't really um, effectively implemented. Or customers of customers. Customers right? of customers, yeah. indeed. And what does that mean for you? What does it mean for your exposure to the regulatory regimes that, that you operate under? Do you have joint ventures in those countries? Do you have subsidiaries or offshoots in those countries, as well as the customer and customer customer issues? So I think the part of this chaos I mentioned earlier is we've had a, a, a well-established um, I think well-established approach on, on a whole range of issues to do with money laundering and sanctions over the last 20, 30 years. That may change. And I think there's, there's great efforts being made to try and get that consistency, which is, I think, good for all of us. But if that doesn't happen, we get the breakdown. Are you ready for it? And are you planning for it as financial crime professionals? I haven't had any questions coming through from the audience. We're either stunning you into silence or it's so interesting um, that you, you, you're enjoying the conversation, but please do have some questions coming through. Sorry, where you wanted to come in? Yeah, so I, I just wanted to, you know, you, you answered really important question about is it enough? Have you done yep. enough? You know, that thing. And I think I want to bring it back to what Nicole started off, which talked about the whole risk assessment, right? Different types of risk assessment, um, customer risk assessment, I think it all comes down to this question, you know, that risk at any given point in time, it probably does feel like you've done enough, but we must recognize that it is a point in time, right? Mm -hmm. If you've done a risk assessment, let's say six months ago, but your, the nature of banking is just dynamic, you know, your risk appetite is constantly evolving. There are new threats and or new interests or new areas you want to get into 
and therefore, by definition, to feel comfortable that this enough needs to be reevaluated. And so this comes back to this whole process. When you do a risk assessment, it fundamentally should ask the question, are you comfortable, right? Do you know what your risk appetite is? And knowing what your risk appetite six months ago doesn't necessarily translate to what your risk appetite six months later. Mm -hmm. And that requires a very dynamic approach to think, understanding how your program is evolving as you engage in your business activity, right? Um, and I think that's the biggest challenge is oftentimes I've talked to so many institutions that, you know, they do a risk assessment, they put it aside, they said, oh, I did it last year, I do it annually. But you don't engage in business activities on an annual basis. You don't engage with your customer on an annual basis. They're using your services on a continuous basis. Yeah. So I think it, it brings everyone back to this, you know, perpetual nature, really, of what we do, right? Uh, whether it's, you know, perpetual KYC, you know, and, and so on. Um, to, to say that, you know, you've done something and it's okay, you know, put it, put it aside, but business isn't okay. And I think that's the fundamental question. You bring it back to your key stakeholder, you know, if you spend X to mitigate a risk, what does that risk look like now? And you should be able to answer that question before you can go back to the key stakeholder and say, I need more resources. Yeah, it, and it, it's, it's really about predicting what the next risks are rather than looking at them again in, in retrospect, Gavin, which is your point. Correct. Yeah. And, and, and on that point of, of, of understanding the risks facing your organizations, I think one of the things that, that you need to think about as, as financial crime professionals is, are you getting your information from a wide enough set of sources that you're seeing the reality of the threats that exist right now and going forward? And I think that it's something I often have conversations with, with, with colleagues about in terms of looking outside of the main sources of data and information that you're getting to really have that broader understanding of what may be the risks out there. So the FATF mutual elevation reports, I actually think they're great. I, I, I do read as many as I can, and I think they give a really good insight uh, into, into the key focus areas from the, uh, from the inspection teams. We have the OSTRAC guidance notes and, and many other supportable materials from OSTRAC. We have mainstream media reports as well that gives insights into current um, criminal activity that's de been detected and reporting upon. But in addition to those, what I call the, the, the main obvious sources of, of risk information, there are a host of data points that you should be thinking of to really broaden your understanding of risk for your organization. And some of these sites are becoming more difficult to find as censorship increases. Certainly in, in some European countries, the UK, for example, um, they have effectively, a number of the ISPs have limited access to Russia today, as an example, due to the war in, in, in the Ukraine. Now, absolutely understand the reasons for that, but actually there's a lot of historical data on that particular um, news site about ownership of oligarchs, ownership by oligarchs of assets globally. So you have to be thinking about alternative sources of information to widen you and your team's understanding of where the risks come from. And I think in Australia, we, we, we sometimes take the easy route, Sharon. We look at what's produced from the mainstream and we, we fail to think about where the risks may lie that aren't in the newspapers yet, but will be in 12 months time. Yeah. I remember working on an investigation in, in, in Singapore and there were some allegations against a particular politician um, on a on a blog that was very hard to find. The allegations were 100% accurate. It took 18 months to come out in, in the press and the courts. Without that alternative information source, I think there would have been a very different risk decision um, on that particular customer. Yeah, I think that's, that's really insightful, that media monitoring is beyond what's just easily accessible. Yep. Yeah, David. Just, just add a, a couple of points to that. One of them is about one of the one of the global priorities that's set by the FATF ministers um, earlier this year and it's been reinforced by the new FATF president, which is on, it's a perennial issue, but it's, it doesn't make it not a kind of global priorities, which is in relation to money laundering and, and corruption, including grand corruption. And it does tie in quite well with the sanctions piece in relation to, to Russia. Um, and the, exactly the point that, that you've made about a sort of information sources on that. And while this has been an area of focus course for Australia for a long time. It's, it's an area that almost can never have enough, enough focus, but the key there is about the right types of information sources and how 
and how they work to understand the threats. Um, and, then, and then the risk mitigation um, can, be, can be more deeply considered and, and added into, um, into this piece. The, the other, the other, one of the other areas that was mentioned in, in that statement from ministers um, and the president, and, and among others, um, is in relation to a perennial of tax it was sort of mentioned in that way and the economic headwinds that we're, that we could, that we're already feeling and, and probably going to get worse. That one thing I can be sure of is in relation to revenue, the revenue base of government is going to be fundamental in all of this. And there are so many, really, you know, the history of, of the FTRA and AUSTRAC and, and, and tax compliance have, have always gone hand in hand. Mm -hmm. And it's certainly the Australian Tax Office and in other jurisdictions, their equivalents are such a key user of the, of the work that you do um, going back in to, to sort of reinforce the transparency of the economy and improve the, the level playing field actually, and, and especially the, the, the tax return. So I, I can see this being um, increasingly important. It's always been important, but, but the times that we're in, I think will drive government in relation to, to, to this area. I also want to highlight that the, the point in relation to risk assessments is especially the signals in countries where, where not all of the required areas um, are regulated, it sometimes sends a bit of a mixed signals in relation to what sort of risk assessments you should be focusing on. But, but, but I suppose I would absolutely implore you to look at, at really what the fat of standards are plus plus in relation to, to the scope of your assessment of risk and your monitoring of risk. That, um, that, that while a particular markets that you might be in, it, there's not a level playing field between them necessarily, but the expectation is pretty clear. And then the questions of when things do catch up, what, what will be expected will, will have been that you will have had a risk-based approach to, to the coverage of those sectors and dealing with those sorts of customers and, that, and, and those lines of business from, from the get-go. So th that will be a really important part, something that you can sort of take back straight away. And uh, I did say it was very dangerous to give me technology. The iPad here didn't have any questions on, but I've got a new one now and it's got loads. So thank you very much. Um, David, there are a couple of questions for you which might just take us off in, in, in a different route. So firstly, around uh, tranche two um, and the question is uh, Australia not having introduced tranche two does it set a, uh, a, a dangerous standard for APG members um, but there's also something around um, does you know is Australia at risk of grey listing under FATF and I think those two in my mind are not unconnected. Sure um, so the precedent I, I, I mentioned before that that there is, um, well, there are a number of key FATF members that are in the Asia Pacific and are also APG members who, who carry the same sorts of challenges with covering all the necessary sectors to be covered. So as an example, real estate, um, Australia is not alone in this, um, in our region. And so the United States and Canada are two other examples. As an aside, with, with sort of good sources of information, last week the, um, there was a very large commission of inquiry in Canada, in British Columbia, in relation to money laundering through the, through the BC economy. And it's really interesting, actually, there are many features about British Columbia that are not so dissimilar to Australia, that it's um, a, a, large, a large connection back to Asia Pacific, especially North Asia, trade and investment, real estate bubbles, um, very established and very... Um, stable financial sector, especially banking sector, incredibly attractive for money launderers to get their money into the system because you can enforce contracts and there's great rule of law and all the reasons if you're a money launderer why you want to put your money in economies like Australia and Canada and the United States. So it is, it is a real challenge actually that, that these key FATF members um, haven't moved on these requirements that have been in place for 20 years. Um, and, but the good thing is that other economies in the region have moved anyway. So, and then the FATF, because it, 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 it it has, it has, well, I wouldn't say it has two faces, but it has a split in its face. Um, it, it's not afraid to apply ICIG pressure for countries in the region for failings, for example, in real estate. So we saw a couple of years ago that Sri Lanka, when their mutual evaluation was completed, that they went again into the ICIG process. And they had a fairly tough action plan items that related to coverage of the real estate sector. They had a real estate bubble, um, but in, in comparison to, to the FATF member economies, it was, you know, children's games. Um, they moved quickly in relation to that area um, and other areas and came off the grey list in record time. Theoretically, FATF does list its own members for significant failings in technical compliance and effectiveness. Uh, I haven't, it, they, it's, it, it's very, 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 very rare that they actually do it. So, so there's probably, there are probably, um, it's probably more market signals actually that come back um, from this rather than, than the, the listing itself. Um, and the way that other markets build in, build in risk of Australian customers and, and so on, that, that's a bit of a challenge. 
there is a growing concern at FATF for a number of FATF members that have really been behind consistently over a number of rounds about what else can, can be done. And so they, within FATF discussions, without giving away any, any trade secrets, they certainly do have debates around the table um, about what else they should do amongst their own membership to sort of, to sort of increase pressure on themselves to, act, to, actually, to actually come into compliance faster. The last one on this, the EU does some of that for, for them. So that, that I think what we've seen in recent times is that, is that the European Union through the European Commission, it, it on its own, it has, a, it has a grey listing process and it's been a little bit more automatic and there's probably um, a significant risk for many FATF members um, of going onto that list when, when the FATF ICRG might not be triggered, but that there is a chance of, of, it, of countries being um, designated there. And there was, we, we saw last year, I think it was that a number of um, American territories, for example, were initially slated to go onto that list and there was a big brouhaha and in the end they weren't. But that on its own actually um, pushed open a number of doors and let, and let actors walk through to actually drive some reforms. And this is particularly in relation to beneficial ownership registries and so on. Um, and so the process overall, whatever the, the outcome is, but we, we can see that there's going to be blowback on countries that really have been found to not be doing enough over a long period of time. Now, that's not to prejudge any particular APG members' um, results in the mutual evaluation process, and uh, let alone Australia, um, but, but overall as, a, as an overall issue that this is one that is coming. So on that point, I've I want to come got, back. I've got a lot of questions, okay. so I'm going to stop you, please, because <laughs> this is a conversation with the room. Where am I um, there is, there's a lot in here around customer risk rating and uh, risk statements and risk settings, et cetera. So I'm just going to try and pull a couple of those questions together in the de-risking space. So de-risking isn't driven by banks being bad guys. They have a conservative risk appetite formed by aggressive regulatory enforcement. This is a comment from the room, not me. Um, uh, and complex regulation of high, uh, of high costs. Is the conversation around de-banking fairly contemplating these issues is one statement. So a question. But also I thought this, and, and this got reposted, so somebody obviously feels very strongly about this, customer risk rating. Traditionally, these have come from an AML perspective. I, I do agree with that. That, that kind of was the nexus. But do you see any trends about a customer having two separate risk ratings, one from an AML perspective and one separate for sanctions, maybe, or and or other risk factors mm -hmm. in terms of behavior is my plus one to whoever asked that question. So I'll just throw it over to you. There's a lot in there. Sure. Um, I'll go first. And crisp, though, please. Somebody said the banks aren't the bad guys on de-risking. That is true in, in many cases, but not all cases. There, there are some organizations that still do blanket de-risking or non-acceptance irrespective of the risk of the actual customer or potential customer. Mm. And I think the direction of travel there is very clear from the regulator and the courts, which is individual assessment of the risk and profitability and other factors is going to be key going forward. So I think a takeaway might be to look at your, your program and see whether you've, you, you've actually got that individual assessment built in. In terms of the modeling, look, I've seen it done many ways, sometimes just a, a, a pure AML um, risk score and then other risk scores are handled by other parts of the business, such as fraud and, 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 and ESG, et cetera, et cetera. And sometimes an all in uh, risk score. And there's, there's benefits and drawbacks from each model. I, 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 think, I think for me, a good risk model is one that you can explain in 30 seconds to somebody that doesn't understand risk. So if you, stay, if you say to a new joiner, this is a high risk customer because, and in 30 seconds you can explain how your model works, that's great. If you've got to pull out 15 different policies and scoring tables and charts, that's not really going to, to, to hit the button in terms of effectiveness for me. Stop there. That's right. I'm just clocking one of my colleagues' wry smiles um, there. Way, I know you're very strong on on kind of you know risk management and and thoughts on on this. So, reflections on those questions from the audience. Well, <clears throat> I think um, the biggest challenge. I, I know it's going to sound like a broken record. How have you risk rate, especially customer? It's going to be driven by your risk appetite. Mm. That means you have to have a view on what that risk is and constantly evaluate it, right? I know that it, it, you know, and, and yes, there are models you can do. I mean, I've seen models where, you know, based on your, your financial exposure by different categories, sanctions, AML, fraud and all, they actually put a percentage tied to it. And then they do sort of a 
pro rata number that comes into one single number for you know that particular customer, right? Or they actually like okay, this kind of customer types group we're going to risk rate this way, and then we'll give a certain assignment, a certain percentage to that, so that we can evaluate our entire customer base if by by segmentation. Um, but I think at the end of the day, the question really comes down to. Can you quantify? And I, I just did a risk assessment workshop in Hollywood, like in March, where the question of quali- you know qualification and quantification, right? And then we've gone a lot of the way of looking at data to help dictate our risk appetite. But actually, that shouldn't be the way. You should know what that risk appetite to help you figure out that it's it's validated by your data, right? And so I think risk rating really is a combination, but but to Lose some of that qualification elements. Um, it's really important. I think that's where the problem is actually in the industry. You know, if you look at risk assessments been done, you follow the OCC modelization model, right? It's basically saying your data tells you what your risk appetite is. That's not true. It really should be. And I think that's where we kind of have mm-hmm. to reevaluate and look at that. We talk a lot about automation and looking at data and data and data. And of course, it gives you some insight, but that is not your risk appetite. Thank you, Wei. And, and I'm going to take a little bit of a left turn now because you mentioned automation. And one of the um, questions here is, given the resourcing challenges, why are we not adopting utilities for common processes such as TM, ML screening, full KYC as a managed service? And, and I think that is a really um, important topic. We're going to have to keep it really short. And I know we've got a number of, of um, you know, colleagues next door in the exhibition halls that will have a break in, what, 14 minutes. Please do go and, and have a chat with them. But thoughts on that? Utilities? Very quickly, I'd, I'd say I, I, I absolutely support the idea, but I think I've seen a number of cases where the tragedy of the commons comes into play. Yeah. Where unless you have a model that, in a, that ensures that every contributor contributes equally compared to what they withdraw, you end up with a common that is barren. Yeah, I, I mean, the ones that we've I've seen well are generally like government-led. Yes, yeah? correct. Rather than correct. than coalition of the willing. Yep. Yeah, David. I want to emphasise how your networks and your engagement with one another between enterprises, but in the in the common work of compliance and actually talking to each other about about what are the systems that you, you've used or you've had an experience of and really what's working well and what's a, a more efficient way through to, so that you've got the best information you have to support the choice of vendor and systems and approach and so on so that it can integrate, the systems integrate with your understanding of risk and, and, and that whole piece. So I, I think that very often we're looking for a, simpler, for a simple solution and we haven't really seen them. In, very, in, very, in emerging markets, we see there's much more of an opportunity for financial institutions. We're really starting up this work to have kind of common systems and very small economies. But the, the real emphasis here is that all of you talking to each other, that there's no, there's no real value when you're competing on this stuff. It's really sharing information and finding a, a better way through, and it will, it will help you all to kind of to step, to step higher in that. I just want to add one small other thing. The beneficial ownership registries, the big concern we have is that unfortunately, while that feels like a bit of good news, I think there's no way that government can afford to do the verification work in a BO registry. Otherwise, they will take all of the staff to have to do that work. So the costs are going to be shared, and I still think will largely fall on FIs and DNPPs in a, in a large sense and on companies themselves. And so that's more of a mix, but it also does give opportunities, I think, for some of the vendors and for some more of a common approach just to some of these sort of utilities. So please talk to one another about, about your experience with these things. Not, not to short run the, the marketers out there, I'm sure they're going to do a good job, but so that you really know what, what you're looking at and what you're after and what, and what might be best for your type of enterprise. And, and that could lead on to a whole other hour of conversation, which is reliance. You know, there's no safe harbour on relying on other people's data, um, which was mentioned a little bit, and I know all's probably wanting to be up here on a, on a seat now. Um, any other reflections on utilities way from you? Because there's a couple of questions here I'd just really like to get to in the last 10 minutes. Yeah, just highlight, I mean, you know, people try the utility, you know, government led, nothing new. I mean, India did it, right? You know, State Bank, the Stock Exchange Board of India implemented this to encourage, you know, uh, actually folks to put money, you know, into financial institution instruments and, and the concept of inflation rather than putting money in underneath their mattresses, right? Um, and, and so it, it is possible, um, but you know, to, to David's point, it really does require 
them to go very smartly. And in this case, you know, they have, um, you know, biometrics used to, to, to collect all this information. Now, that does raise some data privacy concerns that in other markets you wouldn't be able to do that. Um, but you, you certainly, it, it is. But Shannon's right. I mean, Sharon's right. It, it has to be led by the government, right? Um, without it, it just won't go anywhere. I know that this KYC utility attempt to, you know, they started in Singapore. They've done it twice and been halted twice. Mm -hmm. So, thank you. Uh, one question, just just taking on a different topic slightly, is anti-bribe and corruption risk management, which we haven't touched on yet. And there's a question from the audience: is what do we see the impact on financial crime teams and capabilities? And my plus one is. You know, knowing that Austrac have got um, foreign interference as one of their priorities at the moment, um, I'm going to kind of w widen it out, but again, keep it crisp. As what's our role to help um, Austrac's um, priorities versus just ensuring that we are compliant with the MLCTF Act? Mm -hmm. uh, that could be a whole other conversation, but let's just get your thoughts. I, I think it's a really, really interesting topic for Australia. So I, I worked in the US um, for, for a while, and there it was front and centre of the financial crime teams. They really thought about it actively every day because of the particular uh, legal and regulatory temperature. It hasn't really been top of tree here in Australia, but I think it's going to be more and more important as, uh, and here's a, here's a future prediction, as we uncover more um, corruption issues in Australia and in some of the supply chain issues from Australia as well, I think it will become more and more of an issue for financial crime teams. Uh, and I think, what can we do now? Well, we can recognize that many financial crime teams and, and, and programs don't really have a good grasp on their actual risk exposure for their organizations. There might be a side policy there or a side procedure, but from what I generally see, it's kind of, yeah, we wrote that a year ago and that, that, that's it. Right. So I think an uplift is, is what we need. Yeah. David? Yeah, just a quick one. Uh, we, we see this in, uh, in many countries in the region where th there's a lot on paper on this, but actually the support for it for financial institutions to actually be able to, to act on it is a, is a real challenge. Um, but I can really see that in systems like Australia, where, th where there are, there are well-established and dynamic and, and increasing collaboration between, between um, the regulator and, and enforcement agencies and the market through through the Fintel Alliance and other structures, that, that those sorts of things I think can really give life to this. So as well as, as well as having it front and center and led from the top and adding to that to the culture piece, but then there being real support for it. I wanna come back to the point about the attractiveness of economies like this economy to park, to park corruption proceeds and to have family members here and, and the kind of integration of, of you know, um, kleptocrats and others and those connected to them that they they want a they want a, a whole term of life intergenerational plan for for money laundering and that that's the challenge that the authorities and the market have to consider um, has or, and has been going on for generations as as well and also there are cycles you can see in the region if you read the news about about elections in particular countries and so on um, and so it, it's not something that is that is a short run thing so building it into the into the middle of the work is absolutely important and I really want to emphasize again is actually the, there's the cross-border piece here that most of your business might be domestically focused but the risks that you carry might actually come from other mm -hmm. from, from other markets um, even if the types of, of services and 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 the customer base and the product lines are not at all really focused on that cross-border piece so so um, and getting the right information about that and you can't all be um, corruption experts about the many, many, many countries in the world where, where rule of law and corruption are challenges. So there have to be better ways for you to get the right information that, that you need. And so taking that back to the, to, to the, to the supervisor about the demands for, for, the, for the right sort of guidance and information and on those sorts of things is, is really important. And again, I always come back to this, it's the collaboration within, within um, your, the group here and others um, between compliance professionals on some of these sorts of topics is the big opportunity, I think. Yeah, I, I again, you know, we, we've talked about data, we've do, talked about collaboration, we've talked about capabilities. I think it, you know, in six minutes, you'll have the opportunity to, to speak to each other and actually start building those relationships up, up again that, you know, you don't get when you're not at the coffee machine or the, the water cooler. So do take the opportunity to go and speak to somebody that you don't know, work out what they do, because it is the power of the collective knowledge that actually makes us all a bit safer. Mm. And, and, you know, my team, and I know ACAMs quote me a lot on this, you know, 
stopping financial crime is not a competitive sport, right? You know, one fail, we all fail. It, it really is, you know, it's amongst all of us to make sure that we keep our communities and our country safe from the people that want to, to abuse us. So, you know, on that, um, sorry, that was my little soapbox moment, but where, yes? Yes, so this, this, the focus on, you know, enterprise and corruption is actually not that separate from your AML process. Yeah. If you look at KYC, CDD, mm. right? Yeah. I mean, it really does beg the question, how well do you know that customer? Like an example, you know, uh, uh, corruption activities, you know, are coming out of Germany for a while between the pharmaceuticals and the doctors, right? Why is the doctor going on, you know, getting these major packages of vacations, right? From a pharmaceutical company, right? So I think it really comes back down to the KYC TV process. And I don't think that's uniquely going to require you to create some entire new process to determine, you know, if this is, a, you know, a, a bribery or corruption act, right? Okay. But I would you can leverage out your current process, yeah. So the countdown clock is telling me I've got five minutes. My clock is telling me it's 11 o'clock, which the program says is coffee. So I'm just going to split it down the middle and say last comments from the panel, please, and let these people go and take a nice break. Okay, so I'll go first. So, so I think your mission today should be to leave here with at least 10 business cards of people you don't know to start building your networks out. Because all the stuff we've talked about gets easier the more people you know that you can call on informally to discuss the challenges you're having. That's your homework. Good job. David? Yeah, my, mine's an observation on supervision. We see some supervisors in the region, and I would, I would characterize, for example, the US AML supervisors as loving to walk around with a big stick and tell everybody about the stick and their willingness to kind of bash people on the head. And I think that we had here this morning the most powerful supervisor in the country on stage, and she didn't talk about, about the stick and whacking you all on the head, but that's coming, right? It, it's not, that, that's, part of, that's part of what Waters Track's job is, and we've seen them do it, and there's got to be a lot more, and the same in so many markets. So it's a, this is not an Australian-specific comment that I make, but, but really the, that, that part of the recipe here is that, uh, is that supervisors are really looking at, at their types of interventions that they need to make to really ensure compliance overall and really build the risk-based approach and for it to really, to really be a key part of your work. And so there's a, there's a really positive story about, about engagement and also the, that one of the drivers, and it's, it's really important that, that you make sure we don't lose the message about you, you, you need to put the fear of God into the board about, about yeah. this thing. That for whatever market I'm in, I always make the same point that, that you've got that okay, you've got thank this you. Your job. I'm going to go to Wei. Thank you, David. <laughs> okay. I'm very bossy. Well, we, didn't to, we didn't get to go to a lot, so I would say to everyone, right, the world's third and fourth largest financial centers is the outside New York and London is in, in Asia, so that's Hong Kong, Singapore. <coughs> Look at the guidance that came out. There's a one on name screening from MAF that was published in April of this year, right? Uh, another consultation paper from HKMA is about uh, cryptocurrency and stable coins. And Hong Kong itself is looking at, you know, guidelines on, on their own uh, CBDC for the retail sector. The other one to notice, of course, China, the world's second largest economy, is already in two years of what they consider a pilot program for their uh, digital currency, the EUN. But it's in two years that they've already had 260 million adopters. Yeah. So that is your homework. Yeah. And, and I'm just going to I'm going to have the, the last word. Um, obviously, you know, I'm, I'm not a professional moderator, but I've loved having the stage today. Thank you very much for putting up with me. Um, I would just like to say, you know, I, I work in financial crime at, uh, at National Australia Bank. Uh, we are under an enforceable undertaking uh, with Austrac. Um, I can't speak highly enough of our regulators. I know there are a number of them in the room. Um, throughout the whole process, they have been professional. It has been a business to business relationship. Um, you know, so I, I, as an ex-regulator as well, I get the carrot stick analogy. I think, you know, really having mutual respect of each other um, and for Austrac to listen to, um, to organizations and trust them, but test them. I think is absolutely the way to go. Um, and Nicole said, you know, she she wasn't really enamored by the supervision side of it. I get it. I used to be a supervisor. It can be very turgid, but when you've got supervision and intelligence led.
coming together, it's really powerful. Um, so I would just say, don't fear the regulator, embrace the regulator, learn from the regulator, but also help to educate the regulator. Because quite frankly, a lot of regulators have never been in banks and a lot of bankers have never been in the regulators. So I think that cross-pollination of education is really, really key. So that's me. I'm going to let you all go for a coffee. Thank you very much for listening.